Hello, it's Scott Manley here. After the flight of New Shepard 31 and, uh, well, the quote-unquote cruise comparison to the uh, flight of Alan Shepard, I thought it would be, uh, well, interesting to do a version of Old Shepard to fly the new, the Mercury Redstone mission as Alan Shepard would have flown it. Well, mostly. So this is a simulator. It's called Reentry. It's available on Steam. And it gives me a Mercury control panel here with all like 66 switches and knobs and uh, multiple displays. And it also gives me a set of checklists that I can follow to fly this mission. We have about four minutes to launch and we are inside the final check. So I'm going to bring this up and click through this. So the first thing is we need to flip the switch to ready. We need to verify that our suit temperature, cabin temperature, and inverter temperatures are set correctly. The transmitter is set to UHF, and we perform a radio check on UHF. We hear you 5 by 5 on UHF. Great. Now, verify the time zero button. Remove that cover. That is what I will need to push if this clock doesn't start when liftoff happens. Switch the DC power selector for these displays to battery 1. So this will just show us like what power is being drawn. There's like a three main batteries and then there's standby batteries. Um, they're all like silver and zinc batteries on this spacecraft. Uh, yeah, let's leave that in the correct position. Arm the squibs and the automatic retro jettison. And we're just waiting for countdown. Now we get a minute so we can take a look outside. Here we are sitting on the space coast. Obviously, this isn't the Kennedy Space Center because, well, Kennedy hadn't been assassinated. Um, and these pads would be here because this is supposed to be 1961. But yeah, look, we've got the Mercury capsule sitting on top of the Redstone rocket. Now, it really does just sit on top of the rocket. The pilot, sort of the astronaut inside, has zero control over this booster, right? It is, he is just riding along. And in fact, the way this is set up, if the crew member did nothing, the mission would still be successful. But uh, he gets to do all sorts of things. And he does stuff other than, say, taking selfies. But he does actually have a selfie camera built in. You see, this isn't something that was invented just, this, just recently. Astronauts have been taking selfies uh, since they started going to space. Let's take a look at the panel. This is our main fuse panel for a bunch of uh, critical systems. Some of these, by the way are so critical that if the fuse blows, you can actually switch it to the two position and that will have a bar connector. So you can risk frying the system if it's absolutely essential. This is attitude control systems down here and there's like a couple of uh, squibs and pyrotechnics there. This is the primary sequencer. These things operate in sequence and these lights will illuminate. By the way, we can check the lights and there's lights over on the other side. Uh, let's just try and do that. There you go. And that's green, red. So there, we got that set up. This panel is slightly different, by the way. This unit here, this globe unit, wouldn't be in the uh, Mercury Redstone 3. This was only uh, brought in for the orbital missions. Uh, we have, obviously, flight dynamics here. Fuel system, that's the hydrogen peroxide. Uh, the abort light, if that turns on, by the way, you're supposed to twist this controller here, and that will activate the abort system. On the right hand, you have a joystick, which the hand shouldn't be clipping through. This is not the Philadelphia experiment. Um, okay, here's like your cabin control or cabin environment information and everything and your communications. And these are your sort of warning lights. These will trigger if necessary. And yeah, you've got a, a little window there, which you can look out and verify certain critical things. So I'm going to bring, go back and bring up the checklist for Ascent. There we go. And mostly what you're going to do during Ascent is just verify things are working correctly. Like the first thing we're going to look at is make sure this clock starts running and make sure the altitude starts rising. And then we're basically just waiting about two minutes as we'll watch the acceleration rise and the speed picks up and hopefully nothing goes wrong. Again, if something goes wrong, you're supposed to abort. Countdown. Here we go. Let's watch that from outside. 
go! Umbilical disconnected. Great. Let's go to the commander's seat. Verify the clock is running. Clock is in fact running. Great. Altitude is rising. And if we d if it wasn't running, we'd hit that button. Now, we want to obviously monitor these warning lights just in case there's something going on. But the next thing we're going to start seeing is the acceleration is going to rise. And uh, we're going to start seeing the cabin pressure start to decrease as it equalizes with the outside environment. So that's good that we can see that. And we're just mostly watching these things to make sure nothing goes wrong. So I'm going to queue up the next checklist, which will be the redstone one. And while we're watching, let's take a quick look on the outside so we can appreciate this amazing, the pinnacle of American and German technology heading to space, fueled by nothing more than alcohol and engineers. Uh, back inside now. So G-loading is rising up to 2 as we burn through propellant. It should peak around 6G on ascent. What do you think it'll peak at on descent? That's the big question. So, um, yeah, this will be important in flight. Alan Sh One of the things Alan Shepard did do, other than, like, r reporting things, uh, he did actually fly the spacecraft manually during the ascent, uh, during the zero G portion again, primarily to verify the spacecraft was uh, correct. Uh, this is your attitude control, by the way. These needles are supposed to show, like this is the booster angle. You can see it's moved down to about fifty degrees. Uh, and these are your rate indicators. Where are we? Uh, we are, but once so we're getting about twenty seconds away from booster cutout. We're now at three Gs. This is when the G-loading starts to rise fastest because, you know, it's proportional to the rate of change as a fraction of this, you know, booster mass. Yeah, 2 minutes 11, there we go, 4.5 Gs. Okay, I guess we're not actually going to peak out around 6 G, that might not be the most accurate. 5 G, there we go, so we peaked at 5 Gs. Now, we're watching for these to trigger. Tower Jettison Green. Now we're waiting for the capsule to separate and fire the capsule separation motors. There we go. So that's... It's fired. Excellent. Now let's disable this. And there's some fuses we want to disable. We don't want to jettison the retro pack. Accidentally. Now the spacecraft is automatically rotating, turning around to point in the opposite direction. And when that happens... We want to you know, we want to verify that it automatically does this for us. So I'm going to go back and queue up the uh, retro checklist because we're going to need that in a minute. So we're in the correct orientation. That's the automatic propulsion system, uh, attitude control system is kicking in. So now let us take this over. We're going to pull this out to manual, switch this over to fly by wire, and we'll turn on each of these in sequence. Try this to see if we have pitch control. Great, we have pitch control, right? So you can see these needles moving. Let's try bringing in the yaw. There, we got some yaw control. Great, and let's try yaw control, uh, roll control. Verified that the roll system was working. Great, so now... Uh, we could try all sorts of stuff if we wanted, but the main thing is we want to be in retro attitude because the retro system will need that to fire correctly. So we want to be uh, at th 30 degrees nose down, I believe. So I'm going to bring that down just a little further. 32 degrees nose down, I think, is the retro attitude for firing the retro system. We can actually go to the outside and take a look at the retro pack on the base. These are the three retro motors. Obviously, they are not needed for a suborbital flight, but they wanted to test it. These are the separation motors that are used to uh, push the spacecraft away from the booster. Okay, coming back inside. And again, a retro is... Our, ah, I'm trying to get it to the retro attitude position. See that? Because the last thing we want is to have the system not fire the stuff automatically, and then we have to do it. Let's point this back. This. 
Retro warning. That's good. So it's warning us that the retro's getting ready to fire. So as long as this is green, this is good. Uh, uh, there, we fired it automatically. There was nothing I actually needed to check, right? So just want to make sure that my attitude remains consistent during this flight. Retro attitude. I, I missed my checklist here, to be honest, but I knew what was going on. There, we fired the engines. Now, um, I want to make sure our fuses come up. We want to arm our re-entry stuff. There we go. And now we're going to start our pre-entry checklist. So checklists back. Uh, re-entry. Okay, fire that up. Oh. Let's roll this thing back to the correct orientation. There we go. That is the re-entry. The engine's popping out. So we've armed our fuse there. Armed that. Armed that. Yeah, we went through all this automatically, so I kind of skipped ahead of the checklist. So now you would select re-entry attitude. And it would normally fly us to this attitude, but uh, I am picking it up manually. We'll roll ourselves back to or, uh, entry orientation. So I think this is us roughly correct. We're falling down towards the atmosphere. And actually, what you do is you start a 10 degree per second roll when we hit the 0 0.05G. So let's do this. That's maybe a little too fast. So now we've started an automatic roll of the spacecraft to stabilize it during entry attitude. So that's good. And start the landing checklist. Back. Landing. Power that up. Okay. So now we're going to go through re-entry. Hopefully we will be fine. So the aerodynamics... By the way, let's actually go to uh, external view for a second. There's something you can see here. Is that flap that sticks out? That is supposed to force the spacecraft to flip around if it ended up going into the atmosphere the wrong way. This spacecraft was passively stable, so if he didn't do anything, it would naturally work correctly. Now, while there's some pretty dramatic re-entry effects, that wouldn't happen on a suborbital mission, but the 14G G-loading would. Uh, make sure the drogue deploy fuse is closed, so actually, uh, that is in the correct position. And at 21,000 feet, we're going to verify that our um, verify that we can actually see the drogue deploying. So there will be a, a light that comes on here. If it doesn't illuminate, you can push the button that's covered by that, you know, emergency cover. But it should be really obvious. We don't need the light. We just look out the window and see whether the drogue shoot is looking correct. I mean, it could. The system is working to verify that there's enough tension on those cables. There might be some tension on those cables, but you might also see that it's tangled or something and need to deploy, switch over to an emergency system. There, we made it through to re-entry. Again, flew this thing entirely manually, just like Alan Shepard. That's how easy it is. Other than, of course, the 14 Gs of G-loading during re-entry. On New Shepard, you only have to deal with about 5, maybe 5.5 Gs, but uh, Old Shepard was a whole lot more. Uh, now, at this point, we're going to start seeing some warning lights trigger. Uh, they'll beep along, but this is a totally normal part of the descent. Altitude, we've just passed 30,000 feet. We are falling down, and we are waiting for the drogue to activate. 25,000 feet. Looking good. Except we don't have a parachute. It'll be here. Trust me. There it is. Drogue deployed. Looking good. So now the drogue's deployed, we are going to start uh, prepping the thing. There we go. We are starting to equalize cabin pressure. So let's do that. Snorkel comes out. And the oxygen 
handle comes out. And the landing bag needs to be in the odd position. Uh, oh yeah, it's down there. It's set. And now we're, when we get down to 10,000 feet, we'll want the main light to come on. So we're waiting. There's the main light. And there's the landing bag. And that is my... Uh, wrong one. Fuel quantity. And there's the full pass... The full parachute. Yes, excellent. So now we should switch over to... I believe it's to UHF or high frequency so we can talk you know, longer distance and pull the pressure regulator out. Landing bag is now green and we're now falling towards impact. So we'll switch to the outside. This exterior view is kind of unrealistic, but the fact that we're so close to the ship is unrealistic. But uh, what you can see here is the landing bag. Now, when the spacecraft would land on the water, the G-forces could be as high as 40 Gs and it could have a pretty powerful jerk and potentially hurt the astronaut. So they deployed this bag between the shield and the spacecraft and this would just basically capture the air and then there were holes in it but it would slow the rate of release of the air so that the spacecraft wouldn't feel the same level of force. It would drop the you know, deceleration on impact to about 10 Gs. It wasn't like a, an airbag on a car. It was like a more passively deployed airbag. But yeah, look, we are down. The only things left on this are to turn off my AC buses and turn off the photo lights and everything. Uh, once I would land, I would have to uh, wait for the helicopter to come along, pick up the spacecraft, or at least hold the load so the capsule wouldn't sink, and then I could open the hatch climb out and get pulled up into the helicopter. Obviously, uh, well, Gus Grissom supposedly had some issue with that. The hatch opened a little early, and in that way, that does mean the, the New Shepard passengers uh, may have had more in common with Gus on this flight. But yes, that is the complete flight of a Mercury Redstone. I even flew the attitude control manually, which is, you know, wasn't even necessary. Obviously, this thing flew with chimps on board. But uh, I think re-entry is a fabulous uh, experience for people that are interested in spaceflight. There's so much in here to learn about, to, to look at. Yeah, this descent under the parachute seems to take forever. So, um, yeah, you find me just trying to, like, fill time, figure out what to talk about uh, as I drift down slowly towards the surface of the Atlantic to be rescued. Uh, by the way, uh, this here is a periscope which allows the astronaut to look down at the Earth. That was essential for the orbital missions because you would use it to figure out what way you were moving across the Earth. The horizon sensors could correct the spacecraft's roll and pitch, but the astronaut would have to correct the yaw manually to make sure they were pointed in the correct direction when they fired the uh, retro thrusters. Some other interesting things, this is like to depressurize and repressurize the cabin. Notice that it tells you to close your visor first before depressurizing the cabin. Yeah. <laughs> Fun stuff. Uh, yeah, as I said, check it out if you're interested. There's a whole lot of other spacecraft in this. You can also fly Gemini, Apollo, and the Apollo Lunar Lander. It has a pretty complete simulation of all of these things. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.